guessed correctly. I've got my notes. Cool. How's everyone's night? Still feeling it. Is this thing on? Hello. I can I can adjust it. Just lift. All right, good morning. Um, so I know you guys know a fair amount about EtherStore at this point, but um, this is more. Um, today I'll be sharing never waste another gigabyte or how to use the space you already have with EtherStore. That's not actually what it says up there, but that's the new title. So, um, Agenda for today, as you see, so much storage, we're surrounded by it. What is EtherStore? You guys can probably guess, or you know. How to get going with it, installation, deployment, and then what I've called dark magic, how EtherStore actually works, <laughs> and then some use cases, and then Q&A. Pretty straightforward. Oh, also, I just casually dropped in that we would just won an award uh, from CIO Review, top 20 promising, most, most promising storage providers, and that's kind of cool. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so the world around us. Uh, you guys will recognize a place like this. It's an office. A place like this. It's a lab. And a place like this. Server room. Um, if anybody can actually identify what those boxes are, let me know, because they're not storage. But we're going to pretend they are. <laughs> um, we did a survey back in 2015 uh, about 800 uh, workstation machines. And we found that, on average, you end up with, we've, we checked, we've checked, we've checked, we've checked, the numbers work out, 352 gigs of spare space on your average office workstation at an average SMB. It's a lot. So for these places that we recognize, our small office, we've got, what, 35 machines? It's 10 and a half terabytes of free space, raw. The lab, 15 terabytes. And our non-storage, I know it says that, but I just put a question mark because I don't think any of that's actually storage. <laughs> Can you guys identify? Like I think they're AV, AV boxes, but in any case, you get the idea. Whether it's you know, our laptops, sorry, whether it's our laptops, whether it's these workstations, whether it's in the server room, we are surrounded by Again, not to beat a dead horse, as I said yesterday, but um, spare computational resources. In this case, storage. It's just sitting around, but it's nowhere we can use it. It's on a workstation, it's just a little bit. But there are lots of workstations that have just a little bit. So what do we do? Well, we add them up. We add them up with EtherStore. So EtherStore pools all that unused hard drive space that you've got and enables you to do something with it, i.e. to mount a drive. That's it, it's just this image, just the spare space, boom, looks and acts, walks and talks just like a regular drive, except that it's composed from all the spare hard drive space you've actually got sitting around, which is pretty cool. So how do you get EtherStore out there? Well, this is actually the only conference where I can say, you know how to deploy software, so. <laughs> Usually this takes like 15 minutes, um, but <laughs> you t take that and get it on those, <laughs> Just, right? Because <laughs> that's literally, literally it. I can go to the, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Can we use Choco? Our standard ones are down here. By hand, PDQ deploy, AD group policy, Choco, et cetera. It's just an MSI. Just. Get it on you, never mind, you're joking. You know how to deploy software. <laughs> My impulse is to, is to explain this thing well. But 
Um, all right, so what do my machines look like um, at this point, just before Ethostore is actually doing anything, right? They've got one system service running in the background and two firewall rules, uh, one TCP, one UDP on a 10 port range and the 37,000 somewhere. Yeah. Um, all right, so at this point we've got system service running on, call it 20 machines. Um, we have our user interface, our, we call it the gateway. Um, this can be run from any machine in the network. And this little video steps you through how to make a store. It can take about 90 seconds, which is cool. I can press play here. Right, click create new store, type the store name in, type it in, click go. These are all the machines that are around that are running Etherstore. Verify connectivity, so some of them might be in different subnets but can't talk to each other. So we make sure that you know, we get the largest set of machines that can all talk to each other and show you that. You select which ones of the set you want to use, bop them over in there, cool. And now you can select from the drive that you want, you can select how much space you want to contribute from each of the machines. If we just take, cool, 75% of the available spare space, Awesome, except for those ones, we want to do one terabyte, there we go. And those ones we're gonna do 400 gigs. Excellent. Choose which machine you want to mount it on, click set mount point, it's gonna mount this H drive, boom. Those are your machines, click these buttons. <laughs> and you're done. This is your manage page, and I think in a second, we will see what it looks like in Explorer, which is just a disk, like any other disk. Boom, just drop it in. So it's 90 seconds, and now you've got 1.4 terabytes of fully replicated, self-healing, um, pretty damn fast storage for basically nothing. So that's cool. That's basically ether store right there that you've just, you've just seen. This is, you get a disk, basically. <laughs> okay. Sure. Um, what do my machines look like with either store? So there's one additional system service if they're in a store, and that's just for uh, responding to read-write requests. And the node with the mounted drive has a user, user space process uh, for serving up the file system view. And that's it. Um, these things tend to, if they haven't talked to any other node, they've got like a, like a one megabyte uh, footprint in memory. Uh, if they have talked to them, it, it caps at about 70. Uh, and the mounted node, the user space process, it, it revs to about 400, during, 400 megabytes during a write, uh, but then we'll pop back down to about 100. So it's not too, not too intensive. <laughs> So how does it all work? Um, just magic. Kind of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, so we write a file in. What happens? Well, the file is broken apart into chunks. Uh, we have variable size chunking. Actually, no, we're using consistent chunking now. Um, but you can tune it if you'd like. Um, let's say there are 10 megabyte chunks. Drop a big file in, it's chopped up into 10 megabyte chunks. It's encrypted, transmitted via SSL to uh, the endpoints that are um, appropriate for it. Uh, four copies, and if you're using 4x replication, two copies, 2x. How many copies with eight? Eight, exactly, good. You're listening. There's a prize, I think. Did you t shirt? No. <laughs> This part's, this part's pretty straightforward. Um, it's just consistent content hashing, um, and it spreads the load um, of the file uh, evenly, essentially using randomness amongst the, uh, the nodes in the system. Pretty straightforward. The next one's even more straightforward. Reading, it's the same, but backwards. Is that right? <laughs> um, when machines turn off, this is when things get, get a bit strange. So, um, Files are placed, or so chunks of files are placed on machines based upon a hash of the data that's, that's 
in them, right? Um, and let's say it starts with, there's, it's, um, it's meant to be on machine zero, which is over here. And machine one and two have some other data. Machine three actually has a copy of what's supposed to be on there. Machine four, five, six, et cetera. This machine goes down. The other machines that are responsible for the same same data on there actually notice, and they tell one of their their neighbors. So machine uh, node two will tell node node three that this guy's this guy's gone. So node three will say, "Cool, give me a copy of the data that he was responsible for." Similarly, node four will know that. And the long short is, node failures are noticed by neighbors, not by a central controller. So there isn't anything centralized that has to be running in order for EtherStore to automatically heal itself, which is pretty cool. No raid bullshit. <laughs> no. <laughs> Never, ever, ever have to do a raid rebuild ever again. You shouldn't have had to to start with. But it's... So what are IT pros using EtherStore for? All this kind of stuff, but over 90% use EtherStore as an on-site backup target, period. Um, we have gone through a million other really, really, really cool ways to make use of EtherStore, from distributing content on-site to having um, uh, sync and share kind of, kind of stuff as like a cloud, um, cloud bridge, all sorts. On-site backup is apparently where it's at, so. As far as an on-site backup target goes, it's pretty sweet. It's on-site. You get all the benefits of having something actually within your own, your own walls. Uh, you don't have to purchase any new hardware. You don't have to spec out anything. You don't have to buy power, cool it, you know, stick it near a window so it doesn't overheat somebody's office, doesn't make any noise. Um, you can literally be up and running in minutes. This is, there's, a, <laughs> there's a funny t-shirt that we were going to uh, print up and decided not to. Uh, that was fairly confusing. It said, "Download your storage," <laughs> which, which is just kind of infuriating to read over and over again. <laughs> but it's true. It's just software. You literally just download it, and you guys again all know how to deploy software. Um, Self-healing, no raid bullshit again. Um, again, no central points of failure. You can just knock out machines one by one. Actually, two by two. If your replication factor is four, you can knock out three machines at the same time and have full access to your data, guaranteed. Depending on how much data is in there, it'll take a little bit of time to rebuild, but inside a few minutes. And then you're back up, you can knock out any three machines again, which is pretty sweet. Um, <laughs> I actually wrote, so damn easy to set up and use. Um, cost pennies per machine per month, that's actually a new announcement. Uh, I told you guys yesterday, actually, we we're going to do some um, new direct sales. Um, and yeah, should be inside of uh, anyone's discretionary budget. Again, pennies. Da, 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 da. Announced here today. We are opening up a free option, so there's no excuse not to try it, which is good. Uh, we're going to cap that at a, what is it, Al? 15 or so? 15 or so gigs per machine. Um, to try it out. So it's like got 100 machines, you can make a seriously useful store. Um, but those machines also have more than 15 gigs on them, so we assume that you know, if it's good and useful, um, you can upgrade it. And the UI will have lots of little buttons where you can say, okay, fine, I'll, I'll get rid of these bright green blotches that are reminding me I need to update. So if you want to get rid of those, you click them. Um, da -da -da -da. Yeah. Oh yeah, also we run that award again, just dropping that logo in all over the place. <laughs> um, and you know what, let's just go to Q&A. You guys have questions, I'm sure. <laughs> oh yeah? What is the latency? How much we talk latency? We will, geez, the number's like 17% or so below network speed. Um, Good storage for archival data, but not production data. I wouldn't, I mean, yeah, exactly. And then when did you kind of touch on this? When does it break? I mean, when does it really break? If you get a system going offline, is it just uh, three out of four or down and there's no 
<clears throat> I got 160 boxes. Yeah. Okay. I deployed this across all of them. And at what point, I mean, a lot of these are go online, you know, different kinds of stuff. Yeah. So at what point is it will it break? <laughs> I'm trying to shy away from saying it won't. Um, <laughs> It depends on the on the um, pattern um, of failures, but in a very short period of time, the data that a machine was responsible for is copied else elsewhere. The likelihood of those of three machines going down at the same time that have all th only three rep rep replicas of the data that you needed is actually low in itself. But there's a fourth if you're doing four time replication. Within a few minutes, you'll have four replicas of all of that data again. So um, we use it in-house to serve up all of our just standard resources. Our machines are going on, on and off all the time. They're actually on our laptops that we bring in and out. And we get files clean all the time. So I mean it when I say self-healing. It, <laughs> it really does take care of itself. So. Um, 4x, 2x, depending on its replication factor. It's just the um, additional replicas. So if you're writing a 10, 10 gig file with 2x replication, it's going to eat 20 gigs. 4x is 40. Right. I, I, I follow that part. But it, let's say that you create a 2 terabyte drive and yeah. you fill it up 100%. Yeah. And you lose three nodes. Yeah. Oh. Now three new nodes. It doesn't. Yeah. You, the, the. Yeah. Okay. So, that, so yeah, there's, so, there's, so there is no over provisioning to handle that situation. You build this 100%. Correct. Yep. And then what about power outages? I'm, I'm assuming that the system, if all the machines go offline pretty much simultaneously, server stays running where you mounted the drive point. Yeah. But now your machines are obviously all gone. Not, You're not going to have access to the data if the machines are off. But yeah. they'll, they'll come back yeah. and we won't have any corruption problems or anything like that. Too. Absolutely not. Which is good. That's good. We um, MD5 everything on the, uh, I don't know the graphs here, but on the way in and out to make sure that it's completely exactly what you're, what you're expecting. So. How does it look in the client machine? It's in uh, crap. I forget where it's stored now. It's either in local or roaming um, under user data, and it is. Uh, I think they're about it's either two or eight gig um, pre-allocated flat files. The pre-allocated with full zeros, and there's a folder with like 20 of them. Or as many as you've you've allocated. <laughs> no, no, no. It's it's in system space too. So it's, yeah, users can't users can't touch it. If they're admins, they should be able to. That's been on that list of here interesting good things that we absolutely could do. You could set up 
you could even do it automatically based upon the the history of the up, uptime of the machine um, to make sure that there are you know let's get a full replica set on some large some large boxes and and not otherwise. Um, it's interesting. Um, this, we found that the spread of data, uh, you know, laptop departs. It gets the data gets you know, re, re, re replicated, and then the laptop comes back in. That data is actually not deleted. It's just invalidated. It's it's marked as like ready for overwrite, but that's actually now a data source for that chunk, meaning that in a way, the things that are, are always around actually do kind of pick up a little bit more of the, of the data from the rest of, or rest of the system. It doesn't eat into your, uh, the size of your drive, uh, but it's actually serving up replicas and, and, and storing them, which makes the next time the laptop leaves, the data doesn't actually need to be copied over again. It's already there. So. Both of those, uh, we haven't run it with Shadow Protect. If anybody has, let me know. Um, and Crash Plan are really the three that we give a checkbox to. So. And there, are there any plans to present it anything other than a drive on a Windows machine? Well, it's interesting. So from Scott's talk yesterday um, around sort of you know landless thinking and the rest, We've we've had a goal of not actually writing the, any of the application level stuff. It's just just a drive. We just want to present storage. We want to do what we do well. And, you know, basically make an elephant's dance and have this distributed system actually take care of itself. Um, but having a backup application that is you see, so we <clears throat> let's go back. Um, crypto locker, your typical um, crypto locker, crypto whatever. Um, just looks for disks and just starts encrypt, encrypting them. If you don't have a disk, you got to go through the application. That's a very, very interesting opportunity to have a backup target, backup process run from a machine that can can be infected. And you end up being impervious to it because your data is actually spread out all over the place. You can then mount the drive later somewhere else. So no plans at the moment. But so once you mount the drive, you say it's No, we're not tied into anything like that. Um, the only way we suggest doing that is using it the exact same way that you do use any other um, on-site storage. So, yeah. Basically, whatever Windows machine you have it on, you're seeing a, a D driver, a D drive, and you can reshare it, remount it, install yep. crash plan, and point it to that, and then let crash plan up it to its cloud, or yep. drop That exact setup is is kind of the blend that we suggest. Thank you very much. Any more questions? You guys know where to find me. I'll be right there. <laughs> cool.